Hello and welcome to Escaping Kasturbarus, the podcast where we rewatch, reminisce, and review everything from Doctor Who 2005 to present. My name is Rich, and I'm joined as ever by my partner in crime, Amy. Hello. Oh, I'm partner uh, in crime this week. You are my That's partner nice. in crime. Let's face it. We'll get to episode. We'll get to series four eventually. But you are my partner in crime for now. Woo. <laughs> and welcome to episode four of Escaping Kasturbarus, where we are talking about Aliens of London, series one. Very aptly, episode four aired on the 16th of April, 2005. This was the first two-part episode of series one of the reboot of Doctor Who. And for the first time in the series, we're going back to present day, question mark? Mm, A year in the future? A year in the future. Because technically present day was... 2005, 2005 and now it's 2006 i need to do you know what? i'm looking forward on this rewatch to be able to, to sort of narrow down the specific point when we snap back to reality oh there goes gravity oh, and all that sort of it. It. yeah goes gravity. because obviously <laughs> at this point it's 2006 because the doctor takes rose back um you're shown like a little thing saying look this is this is what happened last time we were on earth here's the autons and all there's here's mickey here's uh jackie just reintroducing everyone uh, and then it's like boom you've been you've been gone for 12 hours whoops i screwed up it's been 12 months <laughs> lol bye <laughs> and i'm still waiting on the moment when i realize that they've gone back to what would be present day at the time of airing like when they make up that year gap. yeah because you don't really um, sort of get the sense of when they're gonna because like I've we're always, back on earth and it still seems like present day but i've always had in my head that doctor who's universe was always a year ahead of ours but then in series what is it f- 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 no not five six i have no idea um there's the whole 26th of june 2011 or whatever the date was for the doctor's death and all that stuff like oh, that was yeah. definitely the year I mean, it would have been series six it was 2011 that whole you know this is actually this present is day present again day. but yeah so right now we are back in uh we're back we're, we're ahead of ourselves uh and we get this whole pre-title thing and rose has been gone for a whole year and uh it's a bit it's it's quite it's quite moving this mm. whole process because something that uh, I don't really think happened as much in the uh, classic series, I don't know the classic series as well as I know New Who um, but the ramifications of buggering off with a Time Lord for yeah, however long just doesn't really sort you of don't see it come as up, frequently it? That's, quite, no. that's one of the things that um, I always quite liked about it's going very off tangent here already but I always quite liked about uh, Amy and Rory's kind of thing yeah. is that they, they at times they bring it up because it's like, is it Rory's dad who says like they're going to need to stop eventually because they're getting older while everyone else is staying the same. And yep. it's like, it's that kind of ramifications of like, obviously that's kind of the other way around because they've been off for years and whatever, but like Rose is sort of, she's been off for three days. And for, as far as Mickey and her mother concerned, it's, you know, it's been a year and yeah. it's that it's, um, this is the first time you sort of get that, like how time travel affects everything like obviously we're swanning off technically with the doctor and rose as well so we see everything from the it's been three days perspective but yeah. can you imagine like how awful that must be i mean like that's that bit where rose and her mum are talking in the kitchen after she's gone off on her amazing rant and slapped the doctor in the face yeah. which is absolutely Stitch bloody this, incredible mate. oh i love that bit um after that it's it's kind of like the what is it the th- something stages of grief from the simpsons where it's like anger and something like that i mean that. I know, that's not just it? that's not just from the simpsons that's the genuine <laughs> no, uh, five stages of grief but, but yeah um, it's like the anger and then it's the kind of like emotional acceptance, except yeah. like trauma of like where were you like what could be so bad that you couldn't tell and, uh, me this this hits rose like a bus like yeah. the doctor's kind of used to this hence why he's all sort of smiles and kind of going along with it and rose is just sort of in pieces while jackie is angry and mickey bless him he's in uh, a bit of a predicament that he's just a, basically a murder suspect like mm-hmm. everyone's pointing fingers at him and then as was jackie so all this baggage uh, rose and the doctor have come back to and there's that question that's i think it's always kind of been present throughout the course of the classic series because relationships between the Doctor and the Companion hasn't really been present. Like, kissing Rose at the end of the series, that's something that is very... was very unknown in Doctor Who. And mm. the, the fat police officer saying, is this a sexual relationship? And it's like, no. It's like, that's... You wouldn't have had that kind of... Um, that kind of line Queering. in the classic mm. series because it was never, ever something present but obviously russell t davies who wrote this episode coming from very much adult television mm-hmm. to doctor who which obviously is more family oriented 
um, as we've said in the past couple of episodes, there are so many things that bleed through yeah. from sort of more adult approaches to things. And actually, after this point uh, of uh, the Doctor and Rose sort of swanning off to, to just go and stand on the roof and bitch about what happened, <laughs> um, it's it's not only a, 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 a sort of a script writing thing that sort of represents the, the era we're in, but also that kind of... Um, uh, approach to the sort of more adult nature and the language being used because when Rose is laughing at the doctor about him being slapped she says that's so gay yeah or you're which, so gay or something like that she says that's is, so gay or you're so gay which, or something like that I mean you would never ever dream of hearing like or even writing nowadays like I mean yeah. it was a very different kind of colloquialism in 2005 which let's be honest we're very glad has been eradicated and nobody really says mm-hmm. that anymore um, no. but also it's that uh it's also that kind of um I quite like the fact that the police officer says, Is this a sexual thing? Because it's like it's the sort of question that they would have to ask. Yeah. Like it's and- it's grounding it more in reality. Yeah. Like usually whenever you'd see Earth in Doctor Who in the past, it was always a case of look, here's this very what feels like isolated incident. Yeah. Uh, that you can kind of brush off as when at whatever point in time. Whereas it's like this is London two thousand and six, there's parliament going nuts there's you know at one point in the episode later on rose is asked like who's the prime minister and she's like i don't know i don't know <laughs> like it's been a year it's a clever way to uh not have to try and set up all of those things yeah um we, i mean obviously you wouldn't need to know who the prime minister is at every single point in in doctor who in on history, earth but at this yeah. point you would um they get around that quite well but like back to the back to the gay line obviously yeah as you said ames it's, you're right it was very much i was very much a phrase used mm. way back when way back uh, when which, we were all god knows how old like 10 yeah <laughs> i mean we yeah, we had, we were nine still at this point uh when this aired but um that that colloquialism yeah was was definitely used but i mean it's like as we said you wouldn't you wouldn't get away with that now no uh were unless you were trying to do some sort of controversial or edgy or even or uh, as like more of a sort of tongue-in-cheek joke mm. but that's more of a deliberate like oh that's so gay kind of thing and there's a part of me that's like, yeah, okay. A, you've got it as that was that was dialect back in 2005, mm. but also it was written by Russell T Davies, who himself who, is gay but and I mean, has done because like tons I literally of had... LGBT stuff on TV before and after Doctor Who. So there's kind of that essence bleeding in. Mm. I mean, I literally had to turn around and be like, did she just say you're so gay? Like I was like oh that's uh, um, it, that's not really okay but okay sure we'll just mm, we'll go with it it's 2005 okay <laughs> I'm surprised it's not been brought up again I mean like, it's you know, such in, a throwaway in, in, in an, line in an, in an era of of resurfacing stuff from the past that's something that I you know I there's a part of me that think oh that could be something that someone could pick up and I go oh this isn't okay um, like how sometimes things go but like I said it was written by a man who is himself gay mm. And as said, has done a ton of uh, LGBT stuff. Anyway, anyway, big tangent on a yeah. single line <laughs> that kind of just it it it, it ages the series yeah. with that just line because bit. again, that kind of dialect you don't get on TV or even really within society anymore. But um, at this point in time, uh, a spaceship comes flying over the Doctor and Rose. Rose is doing the whole spiel of "Oh, I'm the only person on Earth who knows they exist," and the Doctor's there with their like big list of previous companions. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, okay, sure, maybe not. Um, and the spaceship crashes through Big Ben, which was actually done with a miniature. Mm. Uh, I remember watching the Doctor Who Confidential. I think we re- did not. We really should watch the Doctor oh Who Confidential. Oh my god, the Doctor Who Confidentials the, uh, were so good. After the uh, <laughs> episodes, just so we can go in with a bit more background, because yes. I, I just remember this being the thing. Because we've got all of them on these. Uh, we're watching the Blu-ray uh, at the minute, the most recent. Oh my god, Blu-ray are they on release. the Blu-rays? <gasps> they are on the Blu-rays. They're all the cut-down ones, though. For some reason, they didn't. They they don't have the full ones because they used to do confidential and confidential oh, and then cut they down. Did, what did it turn they did, into? They then did Doctor Who. They got it extra. Doctor Who extra, and then they just they've killed it off entirely. Oh, I, think, I think they did. They did confidential. I think all the way through series one to four, and mm. then they did they did confidential for series five, and then I think it started to die off. And then in series, I think it was in Capaldi's era, they did Doctor Who extra on yeah. YouTube, and then I think for series eleven, they did another youtube style behind the scenes thing Mm. but i don't i remember watching like one or two of them and they weren't really doctor who confidential or extra approach stuff it wasn't like behind the scenes it was more 
like the random crap they do with the the back the, the series now where they do let's do yeah. challenges with Mandip and Tossin and it's Oof. like I don't care can I see they, how they made the episode I mean, the thing please is, I suppose they were appealing to the kind of like audience that they're trying it was to appealing get in to the, nowadays which is the you know the kind of internet challenges are rife sort of Facebook celebrity quiz videos yeah, where will. let's give Emma Watson some puppies how and see what no. happens they're kind of going for that approach but mm. anyway yeah the uh, the the Big Ben uh, that you see get crashed through was this fantastic uh, scale miniature built by this one. Like, I think there was like this one dude, and the BBC were like, "Cool, that's really nice. Let's break it." I just like plowed Let's this like wing of a spaceship it. through it and it looks amazing in fact they showed it off at the uh the doctor experience they took the model that they'd broken and put it on show oh that's cool um so they had all these like all these stock shots of london with a superimposed spaceship and mm. then one fantastic smash through big ben and then it crashes into the Thames. Oh, and they'd have had to have got that right on like first take as well because you can't just like remake yeah. the model <laughs> Not like it really needs to be perfect. Like you couldn't no, well, really I mean, predict how break, good it would go. It breaks and it breaks, doesn't it? Like <laughs> imagine if they were like, "Oh no, guys, the, the shot was out of focus. It's slightly soft," <laughs> or "Oh, I forgot to press record." Oops. Because we shot it. There's two angles of it uh, that you see in the episode, and so yeah, there's that, that, there's that fantastic sequence, and then the Doctor and Rose are amidst. A very pissed off British public, which, as you put it, was like exactly how they would be it was, when yeah. a spaceship crash lands. They're all honking, getting out of the cars, and just going, "Oh, what the hell's going the on?" The army here? are stood uh. there blocking off the road, and it's literally just like, "Oh, for God's sake!" And people are getting out of the cars and tutting at the fact that they can't go to like God knows wherever they're trying to get to. It's like, oh, um, a spaceship's just crashed in the middle of London. You want to not just be British for a second and just? Like, I mean. There's multiple instances of that in this episode anyway of like, have you not noticed? Please read the room. <laughs> yeah. But um, a, 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 an alien spaceship crashing through Big Ben into the Thames, sending the public and the world into complete panic sounds so possible. <laughs> At this right point, I, I literally Welcome. was watching it thinking like there were so many scenes. If we wake up tomorrow... And we look at the news and it turns out that a spaceship has crashed through Big Ben and landed in the Thames. It'd be like, oh, so this is 2020. Yeah, I'd literally this, this just be just like... This is how it's going to happen. So there's any, if there's going to be any point we get our first very, very loud public um, proof of extraterrestrial life, it's going to be this year. Yeah. Let's face it. But uh, moving off these sad times, let's move to sadder times as aliens take over the world in a fictional TV show. <laughs> uh, so... The Doctor and Rose go back to the flat and the Doctor's just sat watching it on TV. And, you know, uh, I don't even know whether it's a party. I think it's kind it, of it, like a semi-celebration of, like, Rose is home, let's get all the neighbours round. The thing and- is, I don't see that as a celebration. Like, so Jackie's got a bunch of people over. She's got, I'm guessing it's a bunch of people from the Powell estate. They're all just come over. They're all drinking beer. So it could be a party. But it mm. honestly just, it, it seems like, oh my God, Rose is back. This is great. It just looks more like a bitch fest. Because yeah. there's that woman just being an asshole to her. And it's just like, God, calm down. She's been gone for a year. You all thought she was dead. She turns up again and you're like, ah, screw you, so Rose. So it's your fault. It's like, wow. <laughs> um, I mean, it but, sort of is, but the, well, I mean, it it's is. the doctor's so, fault. But, you know, we get, uh, we get uh, We get Andrew Marr on the TV. We get Matt Baker doing Blue oh, Peter. That was making so a, funny. Making a spaceship <laughs> cake. And I got... I got really excited at that when I first watched it. When I go back to it, I love it because I, I was obsessed with Blue oh, Peter. Blue Peter was the tits. I have three Blue Peter badges. Fun fact. Nerd. Uh, I, I loved Blue Peter so much. <laughs> so seeing Blue Peter on Doc 2, I was like, oh my God, oh, it's a thing. I mean, Doc 2 and Blue Peter have always had this really strong relationship, even though they're both obviously BBC properties, but they were always very closely interlinked. So seeing Weird. it appear on Doctor <laughs> Who was really cool. And the very apt nature of Matt Baker making a spaceship cake. I know. I, I sort of always wondered, was that like a sort of comment on British television of being like, here's what's trending, let's use it? Or was it like a ironic, oh, look, they're making a spaceship I think it, I Peter. think it was more of an ironic joke. Because, I mean, I don't I don't watch Blue Peter since they made all of the, uh, all the theme song of techno and rubbish. Mm. I mean, obviously, I don't watch it. But it's like, I don't think they're going, hey, here's how to have fun during covid yeah i don't think they're doing that at the minute no. i think they're kind of i mean I, I i say that i uh i saw um a tweet the other day saying well here's the new blue peter presenter 
uh, and I went. I, went, I thought, you know what? Have they changed the branding? Have they changed the theme song since I last looked, which was like a couple of years ago? And they haven't. It's all still the same. That's good. But the episode that I looked, they were still shooting it from um, from home. Mm. Uh, they had the whole here's all of our webcams going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the introduction, I think there was loads of pre, like loads of uh, previously shot like location stuff and mm. challenges, whatever that is they do. Um, but they didn't seem to be. They didn't seem to mention anything. So no. I don't think it was a uh, a thing of like, oh, let's. Sp- Probably just a kind of ironic, like, oh, uh, I think and it was they just, just a happened dumb... to be making a spaceship cake on Blue Peter. I think with the <laughs> fact that it cuts back to um, Eccleston wrestling this kid this with the remote, child. I think it's definitely just a joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, Mickey, you know, Mickey, this is when Mickey rocks up and has a complete, like, mouthing off match with Rose. I mean, Rose is just kind of like, I'm oh, sorry. I don't know. And, Am uh, I sorry, though, really? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's like, as she says it, like, it's only been three days for me. And, Mickey's like, I was questioned because of you. Why I would you do this to me? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and there's, there's this point when we think that uh, the doc, or Rose is going to be outed by Mickey because uh, Jackie realizes Mickey says, Oh, you know, the doctor. I mean, she and sort of. Jackie's like, how, how, do you know, how do you know who he is? Because obviously, as far as I'm aware, Mickey's not ever said anything to her. Mm. Mickey. Mickey I mean, Mickey does know where he's she's gone, but obviously she won't tell. He won't tell Jackie, which I find fascinating. I'd have thought he'd have said, "Yeah, she's run off with this bloke." Yeah, but then at the same time, how do you explain that? Like, how do you say, well, exactly, "Oh, by the way, she like, was he, here, but then she disappeared into space, knows. and I have no idea where she's gone. Like, she could be literally anywhere." Maybe that's just a comment on Mickey's relationship with Rose. Like, as much as she knows she has a uh, a potentially very scary time at her job that gets blown up. And so mm. on and so forth. And he's like, let's drag you to the pub so I can go watch the sports. <laughs> yeah. And yet, when she disappears off for a year, he keeps her secret, maybe because he really is, like, completely in love with her. I mean, he does mm-hmm. ask her, like, are you going to stay now? And... He's very much maybe like, that... not enough time to miss me. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's painting Mickey in a weird light. I'm looking forward to continuing through with Mickey and seeing Him what develop. happens. Like, where, like, very specifically where he goes to. Uh, with Rose because I can't really I can't really remember no, if I'm honest with you either. He's sort like, of, the, the really nitty bad. gritty of, of Mickey's relationship with Rose so seeing this play out like that was mm. was quite interesting but was- the, the doctor and all this had just uh, buggered off he says you know the TARDIS stays where it is I'm not going to plonk another alien ship on top of this and as more stuff transpires as to what's happening who's ending up at Downing Street he's like I don't know what I've got to go check this out so he ends up going to uh Albion Hospital, mm-hmm. which uh, remember that name, folks, if you've not watched the series. What I am um, sorry, I just want to say what I quite like about is you said like, oh, we think that she's a uh, going to be outed by Mickey. It's like uh, she sort of ends up being outed by Mickey anyway because he like he says, oh, he's run to the doctor's run off and left you. So then yeah. she runs outside, Mickey follows, and Jackie also follows because she's literally like not getting answers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm just I'm just filling in the gap between <laughs> like that point but yeah, we'll we'll get to that. You are right. I realised when I talked about Mickey talking about what's going on with the doctor, like I realised oh, hang on a minute, we need to talk about the doctor and what he's doing. Mm. Um so he, he buggers off to uh to Albion Hospital where the uh body that was recovered from the ship has been taken. Ooh. And there's this fantastic moment where he lands he lands in a in a cupboard and he opens a door to find a bunch of army blokes just chilling out. <laughs> I love that, but he just opens the door. He's like, "Welp, this was a mistake." Well, <laughs> and they all aim the guns at him, uh, but they're distracted by a scream. This a scream that was screamed or s- scrummed, scrummed, scrummed <laughs> uh, by someone called Doctor Sato. Mm. Now, if you know. Torchwood, you'll know that uh, Dr. Sato was played by, and now I'm going to butcher this because I don't exactly know how to pronounce her first name, but it's Naoko Mori who plays Toshiko Sato Toshiko. in Torchwood. Uh, if you've not seen Torchwood, uh, minor minor spoilers uh, ahead about Toshiko. Uh, but she was obviously reused for, uh, for, Tor- for Torchwood in 2006, I think it was, Ish. that... Uh, the series came out because it's set like after the events mm. of um, the Battle of Canary Wharf at the end of the series two. According to the um, wiki, she got the role because of her performance in this episode. Exactly. So uh, she is this doctor who's uh, 
who's done the uh, post-mortem, I guess. Actually, not post-mortem because it's alive. Mm. Uh, but done the inspecting this this creature that came from the ship. And it turns out it's just a pig. Just an, a normal farmyard pig that's had some bits stuck in its brain, put in a suit, and was forced to crash, like, strapped into a chair and then crash-landed a ship into London. Poor piggy. Um, but... This was obviously this has obviously been um, discussed a lot, and I didn't really know a hundred percent as to how this um, linked into Toshiko. But it is this, this Toshiko is indeed Toshiko. So mm. we, we mentioned uh, last week, uh, funnily enough, two characters in Torchwood, two actors in Torchwood, appeared in consecutive episodes in series one because we had Eve Miles last week. Uh, as Gwen, as oh, Gwyneth, yeah. sorry, in Unquiet Dead, who ends up becoming, who goes on to portray Gwen in Torchwood. And this time we've had Naoko Mori, who plays Dr. Sato, but she will continue to play Toshiko Sato into Torchwood. And I'd always wondered as to when they do that connection, when they make that link, because there's an episode in um, Torchwood Series 2 called Fragments, which obviously I said this, I think I said this last week, that we'd, we'd recently we watched uh, Torchwood yeah. Series 1 yeah, to 3. Yeah. In this episode, everyone gets blown up and they all go through these um they have these like flashbacks to when they first joined torchwood and nothing about aliens of london is shown during toshiko's flashback it's mm. uh it's her mother and her making some stealing some plans for whatever and she's then sent to prison and jack bells are out and so on and so forth but when it comes to the end of that second series of torchwood it's actually revealed how she was there in albion hospital for Aliens of London because her colleague Owen mm-hmm. who is played by uh, B- Burn Gorman um, he got really really drunk the night before the events of Aliens of London uh, and because he was so hung over in the morning Tosh went and covered for him at Albion Hospital hence why she was there so technically Tosh in Aliens of London is Torchwood Toshiko not mm. pre-Torchwood she is Torchwood at that point, so that's kind of that's the only real explanation they've had about that uh, that link. They don't really explain why she's there. I don't know whether she was like rushed from Cardiff to London because they saw it come down. It could have been, like I said, it's not really mentioned. It's just sort of mentioned in the uh, the finale of series two of Torchwood that that's why. I mean, it Toshiko would make sense there. because I mean, it's not like Torchwood would be preemptively expecting an alien ship to crash through big ben would they so i suppose it no. would just be a case of oh and quick go you're the only one here owen hasn't turned up we need someone who can infiltrate you go and as far as we know uh tortured one is is active yeah in 2005 tortured does exist hence why toshiko is there mm-hmm. but um i mentioned last week about asking us questions regarding the uh the podcast itself if you got any any questions about the episode that we are reviewing today if you're like watching this slightly ahead of us rather than like watching the episode they're coming straight to the podcast i know some people are watching the episode during the week and then waiting for the next week or the weekend to to get the podcast uh but we got a tweet from tony uh obi pong which is fantastic uh who asks about the alien and the appearance of tosh Mm -hmm. Uh, about the alien pig, sorry, and about the Doctor Doctor Who's love of reusing actors. Yeah. So we've already mentioned um, Eve Miles from Unquiet Dead. We've got Toshiko Sato in Captain in Jack. Of London. <laughs> yeah, Captain Jack's the same character, though. Yeah, I know. Like, oh, yeah, um, I suppose. But it's more reusing actors. I mean, obviously, technically, Toshiko is the same character as well, but Torchwood wasn't conceptualised as the alien organisation or the eventual actual series at this point. Torchwood was just the uh production name for the reboot of doctor who yeah. so they could shoot it in secret yeah um and yeah and what tony said about doctor who reusing cast members it's happened a ton mm-hmm. throughout the course of the I mean, show like not only new who but classic who as I well i mean the first example i can think of is in fires of pompeii you've got both karen gillan and peter capaldi yeah obviously karen gillan just appears in that as one, one of, of the, the sisters su- of soothsayers something i don't know but she's in it and then i'll see capaldi plays a uh, Kale- is it kalelicus kadelicus i don't or know like that. some roman um, name <laughs> but obviously amy like karen gillan's appearance in that doesn't mean anything about 
Amy I- Pond, whereas obviously with uh, Capaldi appearing in Fires of Pompeii, it's linked to why the Doctor t- chose, in inverted commas, Capaldi's face for his uh, 11th, no, 12th incarnation. Um, but, like, Colin Baker appeared in Doctor Who I mean, prior to being cast as the Doctor. Also, Peter Capaldi's in Torchwood, isn't he, in Children of and Earth? And Peter Capaldi's in Torchwood, so yeah, he plays, uh, like he plays Peter Frobisher in Children of Earth. Suddenly yeah. he's from like Pompeii and then he's the doctor and then he's or is he Peter Frobisher then the doctor like that's the thing I, I would I would have always found interesting it's a shame that Captain Jack never got to meet the doctor because I've seen Captain Jack knows who has he seen Frobisher. Peter Frobisher sorry I said Peter Frobisher John Frobisher John Frobisher you Peter Capaldi John Frobisher together. <laughs> yeah um because yeah he did see he does see John Frobisher because he, he talks on the phone to him a lot during the course of Children of Earth uh, oh of course he's like he, he, know, he knows who he is and- I don't I don't remember whether he does meet him. I think he well, does. No, yeah, he, he would have seen does. him on the cameras when they're like talking to the aliens. I'm pretty and... certain. I'm pretty certain they do meet in Children of Earth. But so um, he would have looked at him and been seen... like, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> yeah, Captain Jack shows up and sees the Twelfth Doctor and goes, "Hang on a minute, you're that bastard John Frobisher. What are you doing here?" <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Proceeds to shoot him in the head and make him regenerate. I don't know. Lol, bye. Um, but yeah, uh, Tony, the the concept of doctor who's reusing actors is so prevalent it's it's unreal um in fact uh martha's mum played one of the oh, cat yeah. ladies in new earth she does doesn't she i forgot about um that. the uh do you know you know bill's guardian in series 10 oh god no the sort of you only see her I like know, twice what, the puddle bitch <laughs> no, 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 no 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 the the um you know when you know because obviously bill doesn't have her mum she's yeah. like she's got like a carer or i don't think she's adopted but she's got she lives with a she lives with a white woman oh yeah that that woman is also the woman who married and shagged the cat in gridlock that's her as well <laughs> so they they reuse a lot yeah. of actors um i mean why not if you know they can do a good job you might as well go back through your pool of kind of stored info if you know if you know people then yeah go for it but tony also asks what's your opinion on the alien pig that whole mm. concept of just I, using see, an I animal. I quite like it. I think it's very kind of Frankenstein's monster esque type thing um, of like taking bits and putting other bits on and what have you. Um, mm. But I don't know. I think there's something quite fascinating about the fact that it's a pig because I think what I like about it is obviously that scene where he's running down the corridor and uh, the army general or whoever he is ends up shooting him. It's like, it's because it's that kind of familiar, but like, what is it? Uncanny Valley? Is that what they call it? Where it's like too familiar, but like not quite. And there's something off about it. Um, Yeah. It's like, you know, it's a pig. There's a pig running towards me on its hind legs and it's wearing a suit what <clears throat> and it's like if you saw a pig running towards you on its hind legs you'd be a bit like ah, what do i do here so it's kind of that uh that yeah like i said that uncanny valley so i think it was like a kind of a cool thing of use it but also you know if you think about it what other animals would they it would either be something like a sheep or like a cow or like a chicken whereas a pig is just about kind of the right size i suppose isn't it i i've always looked at this as like a funny kind of uh, self-referential approach to aliens in Doctor Who because there's so many sort of times where they've taken something supposedly normal and made it alien. alien. You had the weird like cactus people in the end yes. of time. You had um, baked potatoes with phases <laughs> and the Sontarans. Uh, you have plungers and egg whisks yeah, on cat the Daleks. People. There's all these cat people, exactly. You've got all of these creatures that are very blatantly just let's take something we know and, and make, make it, it alien. an alien. And it's like there's that there's sort of like a self commentary about we're just gonna we're gonna be really on the nose and be like screw it pig it's now an alien <laughs> why not even though it's literally it's just a pig but it's um funnily enough that pig was played by uh, by Jimmy V who also played the Mox of Balhoon oh <laughs> uh, and also plays the Grask and Banakafalata and as I'm just reading right now also played the Scovox Blitzer in the Caretaker which I didn't know oh fair enough so that's speaking quite of cool. uh, Mox of Balhoon. We forgot to mention Bad Wolf last week. Um, we did. I'd, a lot of you have actually been commenting on the uh, on the YouTube video saying that you didn't hear the original mention of the Mox of Balhoon in, um, is it End of the World? Is that what you called it? End of the yeah. World, yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm glad I managed to point that out to you. But so we had uh, the second mention of it uh, last week 
when um, Gwyneth says the big bad wolf to Rose when she's talking. And this is the third sort of, you know, very, very obvious uh, yeah. thing of it spray painted onto the side of the TARDIS. So, you know, we're starting to get that link now. This is this is kind of like when, you know, when you're watching it for, when we were watching it for the first time through, I think I sort of remember being like, what the hell is bad wolf and why does it keep cropping up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's as we've said, that's something that will become present throughout the course of the series, become more important as the series continues. It's kind of annoying that this, uh, that, that kind of let's just plant a seed into every episode mm. and wait and see where it goes. Like, that was fine in series one, but that approach got very old yeah. as the series go on. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that once we get to those series. But yeah, Bad Wolf is very present in this one. Technically, it's present in next week's as well because yeah, this is a two-parter, episode, but it's just but... it's still just on the side of the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. But it's it's weird to think that, that just... Let's just... This, this little dickhead kid spray painting <laughs> it on the side of the TARDIS. But um, yeah, good point. We did forget to mention that last week. So thank you for, for letting us know. We'll try and make sure we keep on top I'll of all of these references. I'll try and keep on top of the uh, Bad Wolf points. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So yeah, so we talked about um, Nakamori. Tony, thank you for that uh, that tweet. If you do have any questions regarding like episodes or opinions, or you've got like a little plot hole or something you want to ask us about and hear mm-hmm. what we think or know, then please do tweet us. You can tweet us at Who Culture. You can use the hashtag Who uh, use the hashtag Sorry Escaping Kerberos. You can tweet me at Pick Up Change Toe and Amy at Ames underscore Elizabeth. We normally so, record. We try and record on a Sunday. So if do. you are watching in the week or if you're watching on a Sunday or whatever get your tweets to us by sort of sunday midday and we'll try and answer them yeah exactly yeah that's bingo so uh these aliens are here in the in in the uk we don't really know why and yet there are these sort of slightly larger built people who are being brought into downing street as andrew marvery point rightly points out there's this mp dude who has something to do with the export of sugar products <laughs> and he's like why the hell is this guy here and it turns out they're all a bit gassy because uh, oh, they are humor. actually yeah they're actually uh, aliens inside skin suits and they <laughs> they get so many fart jokes it's so like in. i mean literally it's just super on the nose fart but jokes. also it's very very when they're all stood in the room it's such stock fart noises like you hear that little like <laughs> squeaky one and it's we, like... we were talking about i mentioned this the other day uh, the, other, the other day the other week on the podcast i mentioned about how um there are so many sound effects that are used that are like i know that sound effect effect far too mm. well and all of the fart noises that you hear in this are all the most overused fart but sounds. i think almost it makes that makes it funnier so fake. because like it, it does yeah i mean it, like obviously it's belie- like you know it you say it's it has to be believable but like y- you know suspension of disbelief at this point they're aliens inside human bodies i mean the fact that they're farting and the noises aren't quite you know accurate is y- y- you just kind of get over it really don't you but yeah i mean the fact that they're just literally like oh, sorry nervous stomach it's like hey farts <laughs> i'm shaking my booty toilet humor um <laughs> yeah I mean, fun, this is one of the first episodes of the series that was kind of uh middling reviewed like not everyone really liked yeah. this and i don't know whether it is down to that sort of weird tone because it does have a weird tone it has a kind of weird the course gritty of the tone and then at times it sort of goes from like gritty to kind of humorous to then like and normally it does it quite well but i think you're right about the idea that um they've always tried to add in this humor and usually this humor lands so well but they've gone from that really gritty the prime minister's missing it's most likely dead let's face it there's aliens have snuck into bloody downing street and no one's noticed and let's like let's make let's let's lighten the tone by adding fart noises <laughs> in now as much as as much as we love fart noises as much as the next guy it it is a bit strange it's a bit of a and kind it of doesn't odd. kind of work and thankfully when uh they reappear in the series they don't make as many fart jokes thank god i think they kind of got, um, it, got it all out their system eh? quite literally yeah <laughs> uh i mean there is a, there is a reason as to why they do fart a lot but it's not it's interesting because they didn't make it a thing to like cover some kind of practical no, issue or anything like that they joke. just added it in for the sake of humor <laughs> because the idea is that the compression in because the slidine is much bigger than the person that they're hiding within and the compression that they have somehow generates gas which is why they fart um and it's like okay fine like you didn't have to make fart jokes because you could just have them being like sadistic and finding things very funny mm. which they already do you don't need to add fart jokes on top of that but like i, I mean... said big fan of a good fart joke <laughs> 
but it would have been yeah, kind of might- interesting if they'd have like if somebody had like the reason they put the fart jokes in is because somebody actually farted while recording and then they just went oh do you know what we'll turn this into a running joke we'll we'll, we'll go with that <laughs> we'll go with that yeah but i think i think it was I, I say that now i'm thinking a bit further into the episode i think it's more of a defining thing of like you see a larger person on doctor who in this episode and you think okay could they could they be a slitheen mm. and let like, you, you you hear him rip a sniffer and you're like okay they definitely are it's that tell yeah it's that tell, and I find it weird. Like, obviously, the thing about Doctor Who, the thing about Doctor Who is something they try and do a lot is they they take things that are normal and they make them scary. Mm. You take shadows, you take statues, Ugh. Uh, Ugh. you take. Um, <laughs> I had another one in my head. I've just lost it. Shadows, statues, kids I know, gas masks, kids drawings. All that episode. Let's, I hate that episode. Let's take fat people. <laughs> mm. I have heard stories of people who have been, when they were younger, who were afraid of someone because they were big and thought they were seriously. Esteem. Yeah. Wow. And I'm just like, okay, that's a bit of a stretch. But I find that as an interesting like point I to mean, use as like spooky leverage, as like be afraid of fat people. See, I'm not sure whether it's a they. Bit, it's a, did it on purpose. I don't. I don't like, think that's. I mean, yeah, yeah. It wasn't a deliberate approach, but I find the fact that that was a, like a ramification of it. <laughs> That it was like, oh, okay, maybe they weren't expecting that to be a thing. <laughs> Oops, maybe we should uh, reverse this. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I wouldn't say that they're fat per se. They're just like, you know, they just they they have to be bigger people. Mm. I mean, they do they do mention this. They do outright say like they are usually slightly larger people that they consume. Yeah. Or I'm intrigued actually when they take over the uh, the the army general. What do they do with his insides? Do they eat them? Well, they must do because, because I mean, the other body suit was completely empty, wasn't it? It was empty when they so threw they it out. So they probably just interest- um, maybe they absorb it, kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> or they just like flatten it down, like they just like literally Squish just stretch it into the his inside. Toes. Of it. Yeah, <laughs> but this is this this skin suit this this ditch is picked up by someone we've not spoken about yet, which we need to talk about, uh, and that's Penelope Wilton's Harriet Jones, oh, MP every- for Fly Down North. <laughs> so a recurring character throughout the course of series one to four. Uh, and I think she's mentioned in... Actually, yeah, she is, she's definitely mentioned by um, Peter Capaldi, mm. I think. And I'm pretty certain that... Um, actually, you know what? I'm almost certain every Doctor's mentioned them. She's only mentioned, in like four uh, episodes, though, isn't she, altogether? She's not in much. But yeah, maybe... Yeah, I think it actually is four episodes. Yeah, I think I uh, wicked I'm, I'm pretty... <laughs> I'm pretty certain that Harriet Jones is mentioned by Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi, and even Jodie Whittaker. I want to say that I've heard Jodie Whittaker That's say That's how Harriet annoying Jones. she is. <laughs> but yeah, so obviously we'll see more of uh, Harriet Jones come the uh, Christmas special and through uh, the course of the Russell T. Davies era, which is from now until series four. But going back to this, as much as her running gag is Harriet Jones... MP for Flat or North. Yes, the next we know one we who won't you talk are. about yet. <laughs> um, when we see her for the first time, she's coming into Downing Street, and it's like, "Read the room, woman. This is not the time to be going about like asking about cottage hospitals." But the thing that we've both realised when we're watching this, she is so annoying. She's a bit of a Karen. <laughs> yeah, as it is defined as a term nowadays, is she's, she's a Karen. Not as like. She's not as bad as like forcing herself into a situation, but it's kind of I like mean, she sort look, of is though. Yeah, it's more a case of you're asking the wrong questions, or you're just you're just here at the wrong time. Like you should use your common sense. Yeah, aliens have just crash landed in the middle of London. Stop asking about cottage hospitals. And it's like you see that guy who talks to her, whatever his name is, the guy who's the assistant or the right hand guy or whoever. Um, yeah and you sort of see him going like woman come on like it, it you know you might have had an appointment but a spaceship just crashed into london it's like yeah harriet you are being a little bit of a um a kind of uh stupid <laughs> yeah and you know we, we we know harriet jones in the future as this like absolute badass of a character she's amazing as the series progresses and she becomes such a strong female character but this really shows how far she goes mm. because she's just this sort of whiny, insignificant character that's just sort of always hovering about. 
and she just kind of gets thrown into the mix like you know she yeah she she is she, she is very much in the wrong she place never the wrong intended time. to be she literally just wanted to slip in the fact that she wanted some cottage hospitals being sorted or something and then she opens this thing and she sees emergency protocols and then she has to hide in the cupboard and then whoops bob's your uncle she's right in the center of all this yeah and it's 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 uh it's interesting to see how she progresses from here, but we we won't dwell on that yet because we don't we only really see her being sort of whiny and scared um, over the course of this episode. The next episode we get to see sort of more. She becomes more confident, mm. uh, and then we'll see her future. We'll talk about when we get to uh, the end of series one or technically beginning of series two. It's kind of a it's kind of a grey area in between. Um, but yeah, so that's this is the first of a couple of appearances from uh, Penelope Wilson as, as Harriet Jones. MP for Florida North. Fantastic actress. Oh, yeah, fantastic. I loved her in Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what she's like, in. It's like, oh, it's Harriet Jones. No, it's Shaun's <laughs> mum. No, it's Harriet Jones. It's Harriet Jones. It's definitely Harriet Jones married to Bill Nye. I, I ship it. I totally ship it. <laughs> so, um, so we were saying about how Mickey was outing Rose to, to Jackie. The doctor gives Rose a TARDIS key. And this is another thing I was going to mention. Do you know, Amy, what the TARDIS key looked like in the classic series? No, um, I don't really know anything about the classic because, series. Because in, in the classic series, obviously, we know it now as just a standard like Yale key. Mm. Uh, but in the classic series, it was like a weird... It was like a shield with little like like shapes on it. I'll get you to Google it after oh, okay. the podcast Hang so on. you can see it yourself. Um, and... This is where they go, okay, we're going to really ground this show even further. Here's a TARDIS key. It is just a key. It's just a key on a long chain. Oh, I see. It's That's... got the... Uh... Hang on. I'm Googling the key. <laughs> the Amy's present. having a look at the picture of the key. It's got the, it's got always... the seal of Rassilon on it. Has it as well? I don't know I if you remember. can see that on the camera. Oh, that's... Okay, that's not actually the TARDIS key I was thinking of. Oh, is of. it not? Because it's got... Um... No, I, I know a TARDIS key that looks oh, kind of like a little uh, shield. That? With... Wow. Yeah, I think that's the one's like at the bottom. That's different ones. Yeah, so it's, like it's, a, like... it's got like a kind of cross at the top, and then underneath that is like a shield block, and then it's got kind of like triangles like fitting around each other. But yeah. there is one in the middle with the seal of Rassilon at the top, and that's got like a kind of guitar strings down the middle of it, which looks kind of cool. Yeah. Basically, I, I... Google Doctor Who classic who tardis keys and it will come up <laughs> yeah it's an interesting shape and yet with the the new series they just went you know what let's 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 get rid of that let's just give let's just give them a key just give them a key mm. um and when rose jackie and mickey go outside the the key starts glowing because the doctor's been to Albin hospital he's spoken to uh, to tosh uh, he's seen the pig and he comes back to the powerless state and jackie sees the tardis materialize for the first time and she's like oh my and god she this basically is, this is just kind of doing. craps herself and runs away and, uh, <laughs> well she actually she actually comes into the tardis because rose jumps in and then mickey and jackie follow her in mickey's obviously already seen the inside of the tardis he knows what to expect now so he's a lot cooler in that situation jackie's obviously like oh my god what the hell is this don't make this a domestic <laughs> yeah I love the fact the doctor calls him Ricky. Ricky. I love just just to wind him just up. Just the tongue in cheek so, of Eccleston's doctor. It's so petty, but I, th- I think it's down to it's like it's like you like a girl, mm. you know she's got a boyfriend, which means you instantly think I don't like you. But I mean, because you're with the girl I want to be he with. He also didn't really do much to make himself kind of like favorable in the first meeting with the doctor did he like i mean the doctor just kind of sees him as this idiot little thing that just gets stolen then by the nesting I mean, mickey, consciousness mickey the idiot exactly so, yeah. um but so i love the fact that he calls him ricky and mickey's like do you even know my name ricky mickey actually no it's ricky like that's oh, just I it. know. it's ricky <laughs> um so jackie runs off goes back into the flat and she's looking at the tv and sees the uh, the helpline and uh, interestingly there's been no mention of unit yet mm. uh, in the episode where you'd assume because we're back on earth and there's aliens that unit would be all over it but obviously unit was something that was so heavily prevalent through the 1970s that it was just a more classic who thing that hadn't really been broached yet rather than just having to go oh by the way here's unit mm. um uh they 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 sort of they lead you in with it quite easily but they haven't been around yet um but yeah the uh, jackie phones up and says you know doctor blue box i don't recall the doctor saying no i don't either that's what i was thinking that's what i find weird the fact that 
Unless he's... I mean, that, that, unless there's like a deleted scene of Mickey outside because he sort of points at the TARDIS when it arrives at Jackie, like, oh, this is where she's been. Maybe when Rose runs inside, ja- Mickey says to, to to Jackie, this is cool, this is the TARDIS. There must be some sort of like um, dia- dialogue that we just skipped past, like maybe when Mickey's shouting at Rose or maybe when something's going on or something, like somebody must have said the word TARDIS at some we'll have point. To, we'll have to look back at yeah. that, yeah. But um, she says TARDIS and this sets off all the alarms, even though the word the doctor doesn't. Yeah, well, I suppose if if you just Google the doctor, it could come up with anything. I mean, it's not exactly like they're using Google, they're using their government database. Well, yeah, I know, but like, you know, a doctor is just a doctor. Like, I know that it's the doctor, but it's, you know, it's not enough of a keyword to link it to him without saying like blue box and TARDIS and stuff like that. Yeah. So TARDIS sets everything off, all the alarms go off. They've just taken over the uh, police general's body, the Slitheen have, and um, I think he's called... Um, I've got his name up. I think it's... Is it Indra Ganesh? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the assistant? Oh, right. He runs over just like, oh, hi. Uh, like, there's a code nine, confirmed code nine. It's the doctor, and the army general's like, eh. Yeah, so... Eh. Um, sets everything into motion. They're going to bring all the experts to Downing Street, so they... Because all the... All the uh, the alien experts and this is when unit are indeed drafted in because the doctor patches into all the uh, television networks and he sees unit and he says united nations intelligence task force yes which is which a really has now been is now been changed has it yep what is it now uh i think it's i'm pretty certain it's just known as the unite uh united intelligence task force i think it is i'm just double checking this it's just left my yeah, sorry. So it used to be known, uh, cool. It used to be called the United Nations Intelligence Task Force, uh, but apparently in 2005, Russell T Davies uh, was told by the UN that they weren't happy to be oh, you, to be uh, kind of included, uh, associated yes, is the word that's I was looking the for, one. Uh, with the fictional organisation. So it became Unified Intelligence Task Force. Oh, that was what was in the back of my mind. For some reason, when we brought that up, my mind just went, no, wait, I've forgotten so it. So wait, no, Unified Intelligence Eccleston Task Force. called them the Unified Intelligence Task Force? No, Eccleston called them the United Nations Intelligence oh, Task Force. So that was after but this, right. from uh, 2008, when UNIT come back in a big way in Doctor, because like I said, they're only briefly mentioned, mm. and you do see the two operatives that the Doctor spots uh, in the room at the end of the episode. Uh that's the last time you really see them until 2008 ish so see what i quite like about them being in this episode is it's like they're they're mentioned enough for you to at the time be like oh okay alien experts got it sure um and again it does that whole kind of like explaining it for the audience but also explaining it for rose thing really well um but because it's taken it took them so long to get unit involved again in the series by the time unit rolls around it's like who the bloody hell are unit <laughs> yeah some people might have forgotten especially if you jumped on with tenant like so many people mm. did and that was tenant's last series that the uh, the unit were brought back and like i said in a big way they become more prevalent like we were watching this episode the whole time checking the berets of all the soldiers to make sure they weren't actually unit yeah they're just but they're not they're just officers. the army um but we were expecting unit to be about but yeah unit go down and the tardis gets found obviously because jackie says we're on the power estate uh and the doctor and rose are picked up and escorted Ooh. to 10 downing street which the doctor's absolutely loving yeah. and rose is like kind of excitedly freaking out like when your parents say get in the car we're going somewhere and you go where where are we going and we end up at gatwick and go to spain mm. my family did that to me once <laughs> um fab so See, what i quite like yeah. about this scene in the car is um who is it that the doctor says oh um uh the the who's the most um who knows the most about alien life or something and she oh and she some, says patrick Moore. Yeah, and he's like no other than him <laughs> <laughs> i quite like i, that I just joke. i i it's like Rose hasn't really clicked on the fact that the Doctor really likes himself. Mm. Like, he knows how clever but he is. But then she sort and... of goes, oh, you're loving this, aren't you? It's like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> I mean, she could have said, God, you're an obnoxious asshole, aren't you, Doctor? But, but mean... instead, she's like, ah, do you know what? Have nah. this. You know, we're, we're all freaking out. We've just had a lot. We've had a mouthful from my mum. I've called you gay. You can have this. <laughs> uh-huh. So they go to Downing Street and... The experts are gathered and then the Slitheen uh, split up into three because Rose can't go into the room with the Doctor, so uh, I've forgotten his name already. Uh, you just Ganesh. said it. <laughs> Indra Ganesh says, you know, g- oh, fine, go with, go with, people fly down north, I don't just care. Just get her out of here. <laughs> um, and they go and wander about and they find the Prime Minister dead in a wardrobe. 
cash. It's interesting how that wasn't checked before. I know, but, literally, uh, okay. like, the Prime Minister's missing. Hmm, don't think to check 10 Downing Street. <laughs> Um, and the experts were all together. The doctor does his big spiel about how he knows that the uh, he patched into the radar system in the TARDIS and said, "Look, it did a it did a it did a, a loop round. The pig was a pig, not an alien." Uh, and the policeman is is questioning Jackie. And you made a very good point with this because they all uh, unsuit. Yes. During this sequence, which we don't actually see the Slitheen yet. No. I don't even know. We don't even know they call the Slitheen yet. No, they don't. Even, they point. don't even say Slitheen in this episode at all. So I'm saying that and people are probably listening to this and have not watched this before and gone Slitheen. What, what the hell are you no, on about? No, they do mention it right at the end, though, don't they? They say we are the Slitheen. Oh, of course they yeah. do. Sorry, they do. Yeah, it's mentioned once. Yes, then. but not up until this point is the. No, Amy made a great point about the fact that you can see the zips present so, sometimes. Yeah, um, and not at other times. I think there's literally, they're not present at all. So the only times you actually see the physical zip sort of costuming thing is when the empty skin is found by Harriet. That's obviously got the zip around it. Um, when they're actually unzipping their heads, you can see the zips. But the only kind of um, anomaly is when the police officer is questioning Jackie. And um, I always, for some reason, thought that the the actor who played the army general and the actor who played the police officer looked very similar like i don't they know if do. that's just me but i got i always used to get them confused because i thought it was the army general masquerading as the police officer but i could be wrong about that um so anyway so uh the police officer who's questioning jackie he takes his hat off and the zip is like really obvious really across his present, head. Like yeah. it's just there. Um, obviously she's in the kitchen so she wouldn't have seen it, blah, blah, blah. But like when you cut back to um, uh, the other three Slitheen at 10 Downing Street, none of them have visible zips until they start unzipping them. And it's like, oh, is that a bit of a continuity error? Or did you just Yeah, not it's like... a bit of a weird one. Like you don't really see it happen when the Slitheen come back, and I've not mm. watched. Uh, I think it's called Revenge of the Slitheen. That's in the Sarah Jane Adventures. I've not watched that because oh, that right. one has a that one has a kid Slitheen. It's oh. a bit. It's a bit strange. That's a bit. Mm, and they all, I'm... but they're not actually no. Sorry, <laughs> they're not Slitheen. They're like they're like Blavin or something. Weird. Because they're not. Obviously, Slitheen isn't the race. It's the family. Yeah. Um, which actually, you know what? When I was uh, just looking up at some bits and pieces, I've just reminded myself of this. Funnily enough, uh, Aliens of London and World War Three, this two-parter with the Slitheen family, yes, uh, was actually inspired by the original novelization of Human Nature. Human Nature was an episode that were a, a story that was eventually adapted into the two-part uh, story in series three, which was Human Nature and Family of Blood. Oh. This that started out as a fan fiction that became. Uh, part of the new Doctor Who adventures starring the seventh Doctor. Mm. Um, and it's, it was a rough, same kind of approach that the, uh, the, what we know now as the televised version of uh, Human Nature was. Right. It was it was roughly along those kind of lines. Um, but apparently that was the inspiration for us to Davies to write this sort of family-based cool. antagonist. And then obviously it ended up turning it turning the original novelization into the tenth Doctor and Martha story. Yeah. Uh, for some reason you- that, that just popped back into my head. Do you um do you ever actually find out what their race is called? Because I know that they are the Slitheen family. Because I always used to obviously think that they I were think, Slitheen as a race, but I think they're known as Raxcoric Valeratorians. I don't think they're known as anything else. I'm literally just going to very quickly check. Have this. a Google because <laughs> I'm um, never sure. But I don't think they are given a name. I think they're just known as Raxcoric Valeratorians. Which, if you can say that, ten points to Gryffindor because bloody yeah. hell! Yeah, <laughs> they're just apparently they're just known as Rexacoracophalopatorians. Okay, how many times can we say Rexacoracophalopatorians in this podcast? Rexacoracophalopatorian, <laughs> Rexacoracophalopatorian. What is it? What in what episode do they say Rexacoracophalopatorian, Rexacoracophalopatorian? They like say it over and over again to each isn't other. Isn't it the um? Isn't it the episode where she comes back? It oh, might no. be. Is when is it? Because isn't it the Rose and Rose and the Doctor that are doing it? Do you know what? No, I'm. Uh, I, for some reason, I've just managed to merge Fred and George Weasley. <laughs> You've just thought of the uh, bumbling, bumbling band of baboons. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, of? I think so. I think I've managed to merge <laughs> that together because I know that they they do the whole because they talk about Rex Corcovalopatorius in the next part. Um, 
And for some reason, mom, when they when the doctor and Rose are trying to when she's trying to say it, for some reason my mind just went to like them both like chanting it to chanting each other. And I've just gone, hang other. on a minute, that's Fred and George Weasley in the Harry Potter films. <laughs> that's in the Goblet of Fire when <laughs> McGonagall calls the babbling, bumbling band of baboons, and they say, try abs- saying that five times. Yeah, and they just like mutter it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm rubbish. But uh, but yeah, so the uh, they, you know the the, the, so the theme reveal themselves. The you know the Ganesh has been killed by. Uh, blonde, Does he which actually is die? Oh yeah, he's dead. I was going to say because I mean um, he doesn't look dead at first. He's like fighting, isn't he? But he's then... fighting. I think he's definitely dead by the end. Of the, by the time we come back to that point, and mm. uh, Martha, not Martha, Harriet and Rose <laughs> are stood in front of them. You've got the police officer who's now de-skinned and he's in Jackie's apartment about and to kill her. And this is the first time then, you see them, isn't it? Because they have. This is the first time you fully see them. So you see them be going between CGI and. Uh, the physical, physical costumes suit. the physical and costumes course, are incredible i mean the what they've done with the heads and making them blink and like all sorts of things. i mean you the, bl- the blinking like, is cgi what no because they would have just been little flaps that would have come no, across the thing the, blink- the blinking cgi oh that's disappointing i'm sorry yeah blinking Aww. cgi the rest of it's physical um and then but of I mean, course still. when they're when they're running because obviously the Sabine can run oh, yeah. really quickly they're all cgi in the coming up uh, sequence you see the running cgi sequence, they all look a bit a they look a bit like play do don't they yeah but no um, i mean the, the physical suits are really well done they are i mean i think that's another thing that people found really jarring and one of the reasons why they didn't really like this two parts so much was because of the fact that they were um a weird mix of cgi and uh mm. physical which you don't see as frequently the daleks flying and stuff is obvious as to yeah, why they do them between though, that wasn't it? but they, they usually they try and keep the physicality of the costumes like mm. uh, suitable for whatever they want <laughs> them to do whereas having the Sardine like sprinting through downing street we'll have to replace those with cgi but that's something yes. we'll talk about next week when we get to part can two can you imagine somebody trying to run around in that suit i mean there, there is a <laughs> shot it's shown in the next time trailer of a slovene running because you might uh he's saying martha harriet and rose are running away from it and you see mm. there's just this like slovene's heads <laughs> bobbing, bobbing up head. and down <laughs> and it looks really dumb um but yeah so everyone's dying the doctor has done his big spiel and Ash says do you mind not farting while i'm trying to save the world which is one of the best <laughs> lines in the whole show yes um and he's like, thanks for wearing your D cards. They'll help to identify the bodies. Zippity zap. And everything's going to poop. And then boom, next time. Which, looking at the... Because I've got the Wikipedia page open, mm-hmm. uh, obviously. And apparently the fact that they showed the next time trailer straight away. Because, you know, sometimes when you watch Doctor Who, the new it's series, the they sequence, show the next time it? after the credits. Mm-hmm. So if you want to get out of there in time, you can. Uh, apparently that was met with criticism. What, showing it? Before the because I mean I, I know that it's kind of obvious that they were going to get out of that scrape, but it's also yeah, like the fact they showed exactly it straight away. Thought. It's like oh okay, that's a bit, that's a bit sudden. Mm, so obviously there is more to come. When we were watching it just now, I um I was watching the uh the next time and I thought oh well that kind of gives it away about the fact that they all survived, doesn't it? Because like I mean you don't see. Do you see the Doctor in the in the coming up trailer? I don't think you actually see him. You definitely you see Harriet and Rose, and you definitely see Mickey and Jackie. He says, "I could save the world, but lose you." You are oh, aliens that are inside Downing Street. Duh. You do definitely see the Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, it's kind of a a giveaway. So you know, they would have been better to just kind of do like a, you know, those like very short next time trailers where it's literally just like doom, doom. Doom, and you just get like three kind of like static shots of something like happening, but yeah. you're not sure what. That would have been so much better. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's to come for next week. And interestingly, just this section where it says about the uh, the control the, the controversy about showing the next time trailer. Apparently, the uh, the you're so gay line, which we obviously already talked about, mm-hmm. did actually get some complaints. Oh, did it? Uh, but apparently, Russell T Davies said that he wrote it in because that was how people spoke that spoke back then. I mean, it was. So we, like... we, we were pretty bang on with that. That's just what people said. You, know, uh... you go to a you go to a school playground in two thousand and five. You'd be like, ah, oh, gay. I mean, that's I'm sure the... basically nearly everyone sort of, if you're our age, at least everyone listening to this or our older will sort Who, of uh, you know po- you know, uh, know you know that was just to, a thing naive to things like that which yeah. you know some of us were um but yeah that was obviously written in as a line of like that's just that's just what people said in 2005 mm-hmm. uh, as we've already said things are very different now but uh but that was aliens of london so that's the first part of a two-part uh, story which as said hasn't gone down as well in the critical reception i, I mean I- I, for me i'm watching that and i'm like yeah cool like it's, yeah, it's, it's never it's never a two-part that i go out of my way to go back to if no, i go back I mean, and I randomly can... watch doctor who this isn't one of them 
I can sort of see why it was like, I mean, I said to you, didn't I? I said, I'm not sure whether it was met with sort of lower criticism because it was the first half of a two-parter. However, then you look at something like, um, you know, most recently, Ascension of the Cybermen, which was so much better than child, uh, Timeless Children or Timeless Child or whatever that bloody hell timeless was children. called. Yeah. yeah. Like the first part of that was so much better. So I suppose it just depends on the kind of... Um, the build up the, the to... time and the place and like you know the. Uh... I, I mean I think there's there's more stuff about here about like the approach of um, uh, like representing government and the sort of the silliness of the whole thing I think that, mm-hmm. like I said I think we've, we've already said the tone feels a bit odd Shifty. throughout the course of the episode it jumps about a lot and it, like I said it tries to balance that seriousness with the humour which has been nailed in the last three episodes and yet this is the first time it starts to sort of falter I wouldn't say that this is like really bad no like, i mean it's an enjoyable enough episode like i wasn't sitting there watching thinking god i wish this could be over but i also wasn't sitting there kind of hanging off every word like i do in some of the episodes i'm looking forward to the second part because i know that this book this really cranks things up a bit more yes and the, the next time trailer as much as it got criticized it does really quite like it opens with um yesterday was like a new frontier for the world tomorrow might today might see it end oh yeah that um, like the news reporter yeah, yeah it's a really bleak a approach and it's like it really shows that this is bad i mean mm. we, we're only this is only episode five that we're coming up to so you know not anything major is going to happen no obviously but it's it's it still sets things off pretty bleakly so if you, this is I... the first time you've seen this look forward to a i think the, the second part is better than the first mm, and i think that that the trailer ending with the doctor saying um i could save the world but lose you that sets you up for something that you really aren't sure what's going to happen to rose and how they're going to go forwards from here um, yeah. obviously you kind of know the doctor has to survive because he's got the rest of the series to do um but like back in the day when we were all kids you didn't look up how long the actress had been hired for and how long they were going to do whatever so if Rose was going to die in the middle of the series she could have done do you know what I mean yeah. like so we had, we, yeah there wasn't, we didn't know what to expect but uh, if you are watching this for the first time as said get ready for a pretty explosive part two even hey. though it was originally it was going to be called Aliens of London part one and part two but obviously they oh. changed that to <laughs> Aliens of London and then World War three because it was actually the first time since uh, the original series mm-hmm. uh, as in like 1963 that yeah. separate parts of episodes had different names throughout mm. the course of Classic Who you just have Remember to the Daleks part one to four yeah uh, rather than just giving them separate names whereas like back in the old days like when I think I think um, uh, Dalek Invasion of Earth is like seven parts or something seven and they've all parts. got they've, I mean they were like 20 minutes long though oh uh, yeah obviously. they're like 45 mm-hmm. um, but they all had different titles which just got really confusing and yet they kind of brought yeah. that back for the new series but I think whatever. I quite like that now though because like nowadays you kind of when things are bingeable and when stuff is very like you know you want things to kind of be separated out so if you want to go back and watch a very specific episode you know which episode you're, is you're talking about because if you were talking about Aliens of London Part 1 Aliens of London Part 2 you'd be like oh did that happen in the first part or the second part whereas if you say it happened in World War 3 you know it's kind of like oh that was very specific to yeah. like that episode obviously we had End of Time Part 1 and Part 2 but we kind of see that as more as just one big episode rather than end two separate time. parts which one was the End of Time? Do- David Tennant's uh, last two episodes his oh specials. yeah yeah but i mean like that's you know that's very much a it's kind of different because they weren't really finale. part of a series but mm. but yeah so that has been uh episode four of escaping Cerberus. i yes. hope you've uh enjoyed listening thank you for listening if you've been listening if you're on the uh, the youtube version thank you for having us on in the background and yes. uh, please let us know in the comments if you're on the YouTube version what you thought of this week's episode of Doctor Who and of course what you thought about this podcast if you've got any questions regarding uh, anything Doctor Who really but more specifically based on the episode we're going to be watching uh, mm-hmm. which will be World War 3 please do tweet us you can tweet us at Who Culture. you can use the hashtag escaping Cerberus. you can tweet me at pickup change toe and me at Ames underscore Elizabeth thank you all very much for listening and we will see you next week goodbye goodbye bye bye (laughs) bye (laughs) bye i'm getting last word and not you no bye bye i can edit this i'm saying bye (laughs) bye